Hello everyone. Last week I talked about convexity and parasagal and false meningiomas. Today I will be discussing meningiomas of the olfactory groove, planum sphenoidale, and the tuberculum cella. Now let's review a little bit of the anatomy of the floor of the anterior fossa. If we look f uh, from above on the anterior fossa, we see the, these are, this is the frontal bone that forms the roof of the orbit, but we're going to focus centrally on the area of the cribriform plate, the crista galli, which is part of the ethmoid, and then behind we have the important sphenoid bone with the lesser wing of the sphenoid, the planum sphenoidale in the center, and then the optic canals and the anterior clinoids. And the last structure along the floor is the tuberculum cellar. Between the planum sphenoidale and the tuberculum cellar is, is the optic groove, which is an old term that the anatomist gave because they thought that the chiasm always rested in this region and the post-mortem examination, but in life, it's rarely touching uh, this region. Now, if we look at, on the sagittal anatomic diagram here, in blue we see the ethmoid bone, the region of the cribriform plate. The crista galli is only partially seen here. And then as we progress posteriorly, this is the planum sphenoidale, part of the sphenoid bone. And this is the region of the tuberculum cellae that forms the superior anterior margin of the pituitary fossa. Now, we can see, again, on the, on the coronal CT scan, crista galli here, this is the region of the cribriform plate. And on a sagittal CT, again, we see the crista galli, the indistinct area here is the cribriform plate because of all the uh, fibers of the olfactory nerves that cross through here. And then behind, this is the planum sphenoidale and the tuberculum cellar here. Now, if we look at this diagram, we see here the olfactory tract and the olfactory bulb. And these are the, which I talked about when I talked about the olfactory nerve. And these are all the olfactory fibers crossing through uh, the cribriform plate. Now, olfactory groove meningiomas are basically meningiomas that uh, arise in this region where the olfactory tract and bulb sit, but the posterior extent is not always clear. Some people call this whole area the olfactory groove uh, meningioma or a planum sphenoidale. So again, if we look at the sagittal MR here, here's the olfactory bulb and the olfactory tract. So this is the region for the olfactory uh, groove meningioma. So again, here's for instance a very large meningioma covering the entire floor of the anterior fossa. So again, some people may call this the olfactory groove meningioma, other people will call it a planum sphenoidale meningioma or the combination olfactory groove slash planum sphenoidale meningioma. And I'll show the distinction later on between the two types. Now, how do we recognize uh, the flow of the anterior fossa on axial CT? It's not that easy uh, because the slices are very thin. We only get partial voluming here. So again, anteriorly here, here's the, na the nose area here. So this is the root or the base of the crista galli. And then as you go posteriorly, you will see where this kind of changes a little bit. So that would be the region of the junction of the ethmoid with the sphenoid. This is a very important suture here. This is the sphenoethmoidal suture. 
between the, the sphenoid bone and the back of the cribriform plate. So again, we see a little separation here. This is the area of the sphenoethmoidal suture. Again, a very important landmark as you'll see later. Now again, as uh, I, when I was talking about the olfactory nerve, we can see on the specimen, this would be the olfactory tract, and more anteriorly is the olfactory bulb. And as we can see on the coronal MR, here's the olfactory tract, a very thin line above the orbits, and here's the olfactory bulb sitting above the cribriform plate. Now, most of the lesions, as I said before, involving that area are post-traumatic encephalomalacia. Here, for instance, we see again the encephalomalacia, the optic tracts and bulbs have been, are no longer seen. They have degenerated. Here we see on one side where the trauma was a smaller olfactory bulb. And again, when we had early trauma changes, we'll see edema involving the frontal poles. And this is a classic olfactory groovement in geoma, and we can see the extension into the region of the cribriform plate. We can see the nerve still visible below it. Interestingly, that this is rarely mentioned in the reports, but it's important because it eventually it will cause symptoms in the region of the olfactory bulb and track. So again, the tumor is extended down here on either side of the Krista Galley, which we can vaguely see here. And here is a, a classic uh, calcified olfactory groovement in geoma, as you can see on the CT. You can see the Krista Galley here surrounded by the calcified region and the soft tissue part of the olfactory groovement in geoma. Again, on the axial CT, we see the Krista Galley surrounded by calcium, and on MR we see the entire cribriform plate meningioma with a calcification in the center with low signal. And here's another unilateral olfactory groove meningioma, again extending down towards the cribriform plate. Notice here's the crystal galley. And again, on CT, there's no doubt that this is meningioma. We see this kind of lo long-term erosion of the bone here and the little calcification characteristic for meningioma. So again, this would be the Krista Galley, and the expansion we see here is involving the region of the uh, olfactory, I mean, of the cribriform plate. And again, on the coronal MR, the, the, this is the Krista Galley here, and this is the tumor. Now, here's another uh, cribriform olfactory groove meningioma, and I'm highlighting this little area of calcification. Actually, the whole tumor is calcified. This is a very important region that I'll mention repeatedly, and that is the sphenoethmoidal suture. I would say that most of the meningiomas arising in this location, I'll show you later, start in this junction. Now, some people feel that the reason the meningiomas start in this location is because some uh, arachnoid cells and arachnoid cap cells uh, were trapped during embryolic, embryologic development in the suture and that's why meningiomas start in this location. This is one of the theories why they so frequently start in this location. So again, this is a very important junction for these meningiomas to start. So in this case, it's definitely an olfactory group meningioma because it's behind this region. What is the abnormality here? Anybody? 
Any abnormalities on this image? Okay, somebody said uh, an olfactory groove meningioma. This is a trick case. Welcome, Nate. As Nate uh, and Ben said, I only show you part of the case. So here we have a nasal lesion projecting into the region of the cribriform plate. Any possible diagnoses? Well, we have the usual board review type uh, answers, which are correct. Uh, somebody mentioned esthesia or neuroblastoma. Uh, any other possibilities? Squamous carcinoma, MET, all very good. The most common is this. This was a nasal squamous carcinoma, okay, which expanded and this is what we always look for to see if there's any involvement of this skull base. What may this lesion be? Again, a nasal lesion which is expanded up into the cranial fossa. Has not been mentioned before. Metastatic, possible. This was an adenocystic. Remember, adenocystic are common lesion in the, in the cranial fossa. And here's the lesion that was mentioned before. This is an esthesia neuroblastoma occupying the entire nasal cavity. Again, breaking through, uh, you can see, here's the crystagalli showing involvement and invasion of the area of the cribriform plate and the base of the anterior fossa. And here we have another esthesia neuroblastoma. In this time, case, it really did not invade the skull, but you can see how close it's getting to the olfactory tracts here. Uh, so again, uh, you know, believed to arise from the olfactory epithelium within the roof of the nasal cavity. Uh, and again, this is, at least it hasn't gone, has not broken through the skull base. And here's, unfortunately, a very large esthesia neuroblastoma with tremendous extension into intracranial cavity. And besides that, there was also metastatic lesion here, as you can see, with severe edema uh, surrounding it. What about this lesion? This was uh, preoperatively diagnosed as a squamous cell tumor of the nose and the patient was operated on, but it was not a squamous cell carcinoma. What was it? Somebody mentioned adenocarcinoma. No, it was not that. Then mentioned the correct diagnosis. Remember how I stress repeatedly, what study should you do in the skull base? Always do MRs and CT. Postoperatively, a CT was done. What's, what's the diagnosis here? Correct. As Dan says, 
marked hypostosis involving the sphenoid bone, and I'll show more of these later, this was a meningioma. And if we go back, notice the roof of the orbit here was not, it was, look here, the normal cortex here, this is all irregular. This was, had really no features of a, a squamous of the nose. So this was a meningioma involving, that had a soft, a large soft tissue component which also invaded the nasal cavity. So again, remember, CT is important in skull-based lesions. So again, look at the classic appearance of a sphenoid wing meningioma. Okay, now here, I want, that's why I was talking about. Here's the smallest uh, a lesion that I have Notice there was only about seven millimeters, and notice it's right at the sphenoethmoidal suture junction. So this is, and as you'll see later, this, this is where these lesions start, right over here. And here it is on the axial. Notice just below the gyrus recti, which we can see partly here. Very tiny lesion. And here's a slightly larger lesion. Again, notice centered around the sphenoethmoidal suture. Perfect location, a little larger, and they'll get larger. And again, the diagnosis is that many times there'll be hypostosis at the base of the lesion. You can see it easily on CT, and you can even see a little bit on MR. And here it is, the lesion on the coronal plane, again, extending down towards the cribriform plate. And they get larger. Again, here's a larger lesion, again centered, uh, remember, just in front of the planal sphenoidale, this is sphenoid sinus, this is again where the lesion started. Here it is on the axial plane, and this extended down into the left cribriform plate region. Interestingly enough, this patient was reviewed uh, three times uh, and to look at the size of the meningioma, but this uh, incidental aneurysm of the ACOM was not diagnosed. Uh, I guess satisfaction of search issue. And again, the lesions are getting larger, a larger lesion. No notice again. Here's the calcification diagnostic for meningioma. We can see it here in the center. Always starting over here at this suture. Again, larger lesion, more calcification on MR. Here we see the calcification. We even see the cortex, cortex dark here of the calcification. So a larger meningioma now, which is gradually will encompass the entire floor. This is just, in the old days, this was before we had MRCT, we saw this hypostosis here. This was diagnostic for a meningioma involving the anterior fossa. And you can see, no matter how large the lesions are, look at see three different patients. Here's a massive one and we can see this extensive calcification, again, all in the region of the sphenoethmoidal suture. And we also see in some of the vessels I'll talk about later. Here's a patient that was followed for 13 years. So here it is, 97, here's a lesion. Notice it got progressively larger. It's like a balloon expanding in both anterior and posterior and superior direction. So larger, 2010, they decided finally to operate on the patient, and here are some post-op images from 2011 and 2014, and, uh, and, and we can see the post-op changes. And here again, notice the calcification, progressively getting larger. And we can see it here on the coronal plane 
and on the axial plane. Now why am I showing an angiogram? And what does the angiogram show? Correct, as Nate said, there's vessel displacement. Eric also says, very imp importantly, there's a blush here. Correct? But what is the key finding? What vessel am I interested here? Correct, as Gino says, the ophthalmic artery. And what about the ophthalmic artery? Here's the ophthalmic artery originating from the carotid. Notice that the ophthalmic artery is getting larger, larger. And this is a classic sign for meningiomas, as I showed on the convexity meningioma, but also in the floor of the anterior fossa. Because of recruitment from other, so other branches, the ophthalmic artery gets larger as it progresses towards the lesion, and these are the vessels supplying the lesion. What are these vessels? Anybody know what they are? How's the meningioma, which this is, of the anterior fossa being supplied by ophthalmic? Which branches? It's not the meningo hyperficial trunk. That's way back here. The ethmoidal arteries. So let's look at the floor of the anterior fossa here. Crista galli. The, uh, the floor of the anterior fossa has two separate arterial supply. Laterally, here's the middle meningeal artery coming off. Laterally, the anterior fossa floor is supplied by branches of the middle meningeal artery. The medial era is supplied by the ethmoidal branches, which are branches off the, of the ophthal of ophthalmic artery. So here, if we look at this diagram, so here's the ophthalmic artery running through the optic canal uh, underneath the optic nerve, and then the small little branches here, the posterior ethmoidal artery that had, goes through a small little uh, ethmoidal foramen and the anterior ethmoidal artery, uh, which we can see running through here. They then go through and then appear on the floor of the anterior fossa. So the, the meningeal branches supplying the central portion of the floor of the anterior fossa are branches, are the meningeal branches of the ethmoid division of the ophthalmic artery. And that's why this ophthalmic artery is, is so prominent here because it's supplying this meningioma of the anterior fossa. Now in the ancient days before CTMR, that was our diagnostic tool to diagnose olfactory uh, region meningioma, because this was the only classic sign, the stain, the expansion of the ophthalmic artery and the little branches, the ethmoidal branches perforating to supply the tumor. Now why bother with all this in the modern age? Uh, you'll see in a minute. I just want to mention another artery that was very important. That was the anterior Fox artery that always also came off the ophthalmic. So here from the, the ophthalmic is getting larger. This is the anterior Fox artery, which went all the way and supplied the meningioma of the Fox. And notice, remember I talked last week about the sunburst sign or the spoke wheel pattern. See all these straight lines. These are all the branches coming off from this Fox meningioma as the meningioma got larger and has this kind of so-called spoke, a uh, sunburst or spoke wheel appearance. So this is uh, one other main artery. So why bother with all this? 
Because look at this beautiful MR of a large anterior fossa meningioma. Look, we can see those same vessels that we see on the angiogram. So this is a very important diagnostic sign. We can see that this is the ethmoidal branches, a little bit of hypostosis, and here it is supplying a classic sign for meningioma. Again, see the same thing on the coronal. Here's the region of the floor of the hypostosis that we can see on the CT here, and here are those uh, ethmoidal uh, branches supplying this massive meningioma just like the angiogram. Again, another case uh, showing this vascularity. So when you see that, you can be very confident you're dealing with a meningioma. I just put down, this was a grade one, a benign meningioma. Again, me, the amount of edema you see surrounding a lesion is no indication as to what grade this lesion is, uh, because I just point out this was a grade one, but look at the extensive edema. Does not tell you if this is a malignant or benign meningioma. And again, hypostosis. Another case showing the same thing. The vessel, a little bit of hypostosis. Notice always at the suture line. One other case, same thing, the vessel, diagnostic vessel, and the hypostosis. Last case, doesn't look that dramatic here, but again, notice that we can see the vessel, again, going along with a olfactory groove or anterior fossa meningioma. What about this meningioma? Trick question, sorry. This was not a meningioma, although it looks like an anterior fossa meningioma. A diagnosis that has not been mentioned yet. A bad disease. Does this help? Post contrast? This was a GBM. You know, we expect the GBMs to be higher up, but they may simulate uh, an olfactory groove meningioma as well if they involve the inferior part of the brain. Actually, Daniel mentioned GBM. Very good. What about this? Another mimic cares for meningioma. I won't spend much time on this. This was melanoma METS. You can see simulating an olfactory groove meningioma, but it was also metastatic lesion involving the ICs bilaterally. Okay, let's move posteriorly. Again, the sphenoethmoidal suture. Here's an isolated uh, sphenoid bone. So what again, what are the structures we're interested in here? This in red is the sphenoid. We have the planum sphenoidale in the center, and just behind is the tuberculum cellae, the optic canal, and the clinoids. These are the central structures here. Again, optic canal, planum sphenoidale, tuberculum cellae here, and the clinoid on either side. And here, so this is now a classic, what would be called a planum sphenoidale meningioma. You see, it's limited just to the planum. So again, this region here, behind the suture, and this straight line. So this is a small planum sphenoidale meningioma uh, just behind the suture line. And just this is the way it would look here although this is larger than what this tumor is. So again, it would be sitting right over here. 
And here is a larger plano sphenoidal meningioma. Notice that's grown posteriorly, kind of overlying the, the cella now. It's still just really a planum because it started over here. And they get larger. Here's a larger one. Notice again the tremendous hypostosis. This tumor is now invaded, is now lying on top of the pituitary gland. We can, on the coronal, see the tumor here. Here's the pituitary. Uh, so this is the way it would be. See all the hypostosis here. Notice the irregularity of the bone. Here's a tumor over the planum, and it's now invaded down and filling part of the pituitary fossa. Okay, what does this case show? Anybody see any abnormalities? This, by the way, was missed on the initial read. Correct? Uh, as Daniel says, there's hypostosis here. This is the tuberculum celli, and there's a mass in the anterior part of the pituitary fossa. Here's the pituitary gland. And notice post contrast, the enhancement, enhancement, enhancement. We now arrived at the region of the tuberculum cellar. So this is now a tuberculum cellar meningioma. Now things get very serious and important because we're dealing with problems of vision here. And if these lesions are missed, the patient will progressively develop more and more severe blindness. So here we have, again, this was pointed out, hypostosis, the enhancement of the lesion, and all the various plane. So this is a tuberculum cell meningioma. Now why are these tuberculum cell meningiomas? Again, before we, I ask why, again, so here it is, tuberculum cell, the, the superior anterior margin of the pituitary fossa. Here's the region here. And here's a tumor behind it. What did the green arrow point to? What structure is being slightly deformed by the tuberculum cell meningioma? Correct. As Ben said, Nate said, the chiasm. This is the chiasm of the optic chiasm. Here's a larger tuberculum cell meningioma. Notice how it started right here in the region of the tuberculum. And here's an anatomic specimen from a long time ago showing the flow of the anterior fossa. And here's a tuberculum cell meningioma similar to what we see here. Here's again a much larger one, but notice starting in the region of the tuberculum cell again over here. Here's another tuberculum cell meningioma actually filling the entire pituitary fossa. Do we want to do a CT here? I think it would be advisable. Notice 
Notice it's totally calcified, even that it enhanced it a little bit, but here it is on CT. So this is a markedly calcified tuberculum cell meningioma, actually hanging way down, even more than here, filling the entire fossa, and again, starting in the region of the tuberculum cell. Now, so here, back to this case, and I want to spend some time on the anatomy here. So again, here's the tumor. What are we seeing he here? Again, this is the chiasm. Tuberculum cell meningioma involving the chiasm, which is distorted. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy here. So here's a normal chiasm and the flow of the third ventricle. And this is a distorted uh, chiasm by this tuberculum cell meningioma. Now I'm going to spend some time on the anatomy here. It is really, there's no, except this one source of Bassett's stereoscopic accolades of human anatomy, a fantastic book that shows the anatomy as clearly. I mean, usually you'll see the diagrams of the floor, like in the anatomic, you'll see the third ventricle and all the structures, but you never see a diagram of, or a picture of the floor and the, the bony surroundings. So we have to go a little bit through the anatomy in this location. So here, so let's start here. So here's, we're looking from behind. These are the anterior climbing. This is the opening for the optic canal. So here's the optic canal. Remember that the anterior clinoid is always lateral to the optic canal. And again, planum sphenoidale and tuberculum cellae. So if we look at from above, from behind, here's the pituitary fossa with the diaphragm cellae here. And these are the two optic nerves that have been cut entering or at the optic canal. So this optic canal this ophthalmic artery coming off the carotid as it emerges from the cavernous sinus. And on either side here, these are the anterior clinoid. So no, notice the proximity. Optic canal, anterior clinoid. Optic canal here with the ophthalmic artery below the optic nerve and the anterior clinoid here. And uh, same thing on this side. And if we look at the coronal CT, we'll see the same anatomy. In black are the clinoids. Centrally is the tuberculum cellar region. And this is the optic canal with the ophthalmic artery, which is highlighted by contrast, and the ophthalmic nerve above it. So these are the important structure. Clinoid, optic canal, uh, tuberculum cellar here. So again, everything is very close by here. Now let's look at the sagittal view. So again, on, this is the, the third ventricle here, massa intermedia. This is the chiasm, which is wedged into the floor of the third ventricle. So this is the lamina terminalis, which is a very thin membrane here. The reason it's called lamina terminalis is because early on in primitive animals, when there's no hemispheres, this is where the neural tube ends, the most anterior part of the neural tube. That's why it's called lamina terminalis. So the flow of the third ventricle, the chiasm wedges into it. So we have two recesses here, the uh, optic recess and then fibular recess. And then we have the pituitary stalk and the pituitary gland. So if we go now to look at this beautiful dissection, we're looking from the left side into the pituitary fossa region, this pituitary gland here, anterior over here, posterior over there. So this is the, the chiasm here in an open third ventricle. So here's the lamina terminalis, the very thin membrane, the chiasm wedging and deforming the floor of the third ventricle. This is the infundibular recess, infundibular stalk, 
mammillary body here. And what we see here is the carotid coming out. This is the clinoid, and this is the region of the plenum, um, of the tubercum cell, and this left nerve was cut. And we can see the carotid coming out of the posterior communicating artery here. We can see, this is the third nerve, and we see the posterior cerebral artery was cut, but you see the indentation here on the third nerve, because aneurysm sitting over here would affect the third nerve. That's, that's why we get third nerve palsies on PCOM aneurysm. See the close proximity. But the, this is the interesting area here, the chiasm. But notice how close the chiasm is to the tuberculum cell. So if we look, here's the chiasm, here's the infundibular stalk, uh, uh, and you can see there's not very much room here between the chiasm and the tuberculum cell. So that's why when you have a tumor here, like a tuberculum cell meningioma, it's going to deform and affect the chiasm because uh, there's just no room here. See here the normal chiasm, just few millimeters in life, and, 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 you know, during life, at least in this variation. So there's one other concept I want to introduce, and that's the three types of chiasm, what's called the prefix chiasm, the normal chiasm, and the postfix chiasm. So again, this is the region of the tuberculum cell with the optic canal. What the neurosurgeons like to call the prefix chiasm is when the chiasm is very close to the tuberculum cell. So here's the tuberculum cell, short optic nerves between the optic canal and the chiasm. And normal chiasm overlies the pituitary gland. So you can see the nerves are longer here and the chiasm is further posteriorly. And then the postfix chiasm, the chiasm actually behind at the level of the dorsum and much longer optic uh, nerves. So this is, has a surgical importance as far as approaching, you know, the pituitary fossa or if there's a lesion in the tuberculum cell. So there are these variations. So I just wanted to alert you where these terms come from and what they refer to. So prefixed normal and postfix chiasm. And here just shows you an essential view that, see the stalk, may, here's the chiasm with the flow of the third ventricle. The infinitive stalk will be tilted a little bit forward because this is a prefix. It goes straight up uh, in, in the normal position and a postfix because of the posterior position, it'll be angled posteriorly. If somebody ever asks you about that, you'll, you'll at least try to, um, you'll be able to understand why the position of the stalk may vary from pointing anteriorly to straight up to posteriorly. Okay, why am I showing this very large planum tuberculum cell meningioma? Again, not mentioned in the report. Very good. Genome made the key observation here. Nice large tumor, very important. But the most important thing are these two little extensions of the tumor. And as Gino said, these are grow the tumor is grown into the optic canals bilaterally. And here it is, okay? Cannot see it on the sagittal. This is a large, I showed this before, large meningioma involving the planum hypostosis extending. This would be a combination of factory groove uh, planum sphenoidale meningioma. But the key are those two little extensions. So what has happened here? Again, 
This is the tumor. Here it is. It's lying over here, over the plenum sphenoidale, over the optic canals. And if we look at the CT here and the specimen, again, laterally are the clinoids. Here they are, the laterally. And you will some, they're black usually in MR, although there's marrow in here sometime, so the center may have high signal. And here are the optic nerves and the optic canal on either side. And this would be the planum slash uh, tubercum celli. So, so here are the optic canal. You can see the two, uh, two anterior clinoids. And just like here, extension of the tumor inside the optic canal. This is the key feature. This patient had severe visual problems because the tumor extended into the optic canal. So that's the key problem of lesion in this location, the effect on the visual system. Here's another meningioma, a tubercum cell meningioma, enhancing. But even on CT, you can see what's happening here. Here it is. Here's the tumor. This is the normal left optic canal. See, a little bit fat. Maybe you'll see the nerve here. Notice, tumor is extended into the right optic canal. Right optic canal over here. Over here, right optic nerve. And we even see the... So here's a small... It's a very small meningioma involving the region of the tubercum cell. But this is the problem, the extension of the tumor into the left, I mean, into the right optic canal, both on CT, on MR. So again, this is the key. Everything is very close together here. The tumor is sitting over here. It's very easy for it to enter the, the cranial opening of the optic canal. And again, that wasn't that obvious, on, but it's obvious on the coronal CT. Another case, this was not a planum or, or tubercum cell meningioma. This was a meningioma centered over the clinoid. But again, normally we see, you know, there's not a lot of tissue in the optic canal on the left side, but the tumor is extended into the optic canal on the right side on CT. So again, this is where the nerve is sitting. This was a, a, a very interesting case that Rick did a great job in diagnosing the extent of the lesion. This patient came in with visual problem and the question was, was this a pituitary tumor or maybe a meningioma. So here we see the lesion on the, on the sagittal image is deforming the optic chiasm uh, right over here. And notice that the, on the, the patient had simultaneous, in the same time, first had a CT and then had the MR. And we can see there's a little asymmetry in the size of the optic canals here on the coronal CT, maybe a little bit of hypostosis on the sagittal CT of the tubercum celli. But here's the meningioma. Now, Rick did stair coronal images and then 3D uh, post contrast, and you'll see how helpful this was. So first of all, you can see the deformity of the chiasm here by this lesion. But the, the key images on this coronal stir, look, here's the left optic nerve within, as it enters at the canal. And notice, here's tumor, and this is the nerve being compressed on the right side. And on the post-contrast coronal CT, he did both straight coronals and angle coron along the axis of the nerve. We can see 
Here the left nerve looks okay, but the right nerve, notice it's flattened, and here's the tumor invading into the optic canal. However, on a different angle, you could see that actually tumor invaded both optic canal. And again, you can see that the nerve is also a little bit deformed here further. And here again, so there's tumor in both optic canal, which is important at, for the neurosurgeon to know that there's tumor extension. But, but this is really the most beautiful view. As sad, these were oblique sagittals along the axis of the, of the optic nerve. So here's, for instance, the nerve beyond the area of abnormality. But here it is. Here's the beginning at the level of the optic canal. So again, the optic nerve and tumor entering into the, into the optic canal. So this is why this patient had visual symptoms besides the involvement of the chiasm. This was this important to know that the tumor also extended into the optic uh, canals, actually bilaterally. So this was a tuberculum cell meningioma that eventually grew into the optic canal and also uh, into the supra and intracellular region. Now, this is a meningioma arising from the anterior clinoid, but it's actually on the lateral surface of the canal. I'm sorry, of the, cl of the clinoid. So it's over here. Here's the marrow. And the, so these usually don't have any symptom because they're away from the, from the optic nerves. So this is kind of an incidental finding. Unless it gets very large, it'll be asymptomatic. So if we look now at this die, so here again, here's a clinoid. This tumor is laterally. So here's an anatomic specimen showing beautifully the region of the chiasm. These are the optic nerves going to, into the optic canal. See the gyrus recti here, actually the area of the uh, tuberculum cellae and the posterior uh, posterior planum is not included here. That's why we see the gyro erecta. So these are the, this is the clinoid. So remember, the nerve is medial to it. So this tumor is over here. It's away from the optic nerve, and it's not really, uh, would cause any problem. But that's very different in this case. What do we have here? Here's a normal clinoid. Here we have a tumor surrounding the left anterior clinoid. So here it is enhancing. Here it is on the T2. So here is the tumor. But look what has happened here. Here's the right optic nerve looks normal. Look how this optic nerve is being compressed by the tumor because the tumor is surrounding the clinoid. It's over here and then in entering into the optic canal, deforming and compressing this nerve. And you can see the tongue of tumor coming in here. The same thing here. Notice the size of the optic nerve here as it enters the right optic canal. Look how thin it is here because of the compression by the nerve. So this is why this area is so important and needs careful analysis to indicate to what exactly is happening to the optic nerves. Because this is difficult surgery and you want to provide as much information as you can. Here's a different situation. Again, a tumor in this location. Here, what structure is being deformed here? What is this? Correct. As Gino said, Anshu said, this is the chiasm, okay? Notice the on this side, the chiasm is being deformed and actually 
just beyond the chiasma, the nerve is being impinged on. And again, if you look at the optic canal, this is a normal optic canal. Here we see tumor displacing the nerve a little bit. So this is again, was a clinoid tumor, which we can see here uh, uh, deforming the chiasm in the left optic nerve. And here's another case. Again, the tumor is involving the anterior clinoid. So here's the tumor. But again, look what has happened to this nerve. Here's a normal nerve, okay? This is the normal nerve here. Look, this nerve is tremendously thinned out by this large tumor of the clinoid, actually also spreading to the region of the tuberculum cell and deforming, but you can see the marked deformation and thinning of the right optic nerve. And this patient had optic atrophy and a field defect. You can see why. Not a large lesion, but located in a very crucial area as far as the visual system. And again, this patient had right optic atrophy and field defect, and again, a clinoid tumor, again, deforming the right side of the chiasm, and, and also involving a little bit. This is, a go again, the clinoid and a little bit of invasion of the optic canal here and deformation of the uh, chiasm. Uh, this I'm going to stop now and continue next time with some more lesion and proceed for other types of meningioma. Thank you for your attention.